For several years, I lived along the coast of Maine while I was going to college. And one of the wonderful treats there is lobster. Sadly, I'm not a fan of lobster as a food, but I am becoming a fan of the lobster mushroom as a dye source. Hi, this is Margaret Bird. Welcome to Color Quest. We are going to be looking today at a dye source that you can find in your forest, and that is the lobster mushroom. It will create a beautiful range in the peach and pink realm of color. And because it's edible, it can be sometimes more easily found than out and about foraging in the fall time for this beautiful lobster colored mushroom. So let's grab some of those fungi and see what they will bring in our dye pot today. I had the great fortune of working with lobster mushrooms while I was attending the International Fungi and Fiber Symposium back in October of 2022. I had a video here where I showed some of the results from that particular class, but I didn't dive into much of the detail and I had never tried it in my own dye studio. While I was at the symposium, I was able to purchase some lobster crust mushrooms from a company called Sewn in Seattle. Unfortunately, they don't sell these online, but the people who own it are wild foragers in the mushroom realm and decided to package and bring all of those mushrooms that they had collected over years and years to the symposium to sell to enthusiasts like myself. So the orange color of the lobster mushroom is actually one of two fungi in this parasitic relationship. The orange is where the dye source is, but that is a fungal parasite that is living off of Lactarius and Rusula mushrooms themselves. So you can use the whole mushroom if you find it in your forest or in your grocer, but the outer parasitic fungi is what is going to bring you the color. And it's pretty obvious when you see it because it is bright orange. Now, my friends at Sewn in Seattle took the time to remove that portion so that the dye matter that I have here today is actually quite strong. But you don't need to do that. It is a painstaking procedure. And when I worked with the lobster mushrooms at the IFFS, we use the whole mushroom. You just need to have a larger volume because you don't really know what percentages of that dye source is going to be on the whole mushroom itself. So if you decide to go foraging for the lobster mushroom in the Pacific Northwest, you're going to find them popping up in September and October. They love growing underneath Sitka and hemlock trees, and they can be quite prolific. You have a good year for them. Now, since they are edible, you may have some competition out there while you're foraging, but because they're edible, you can also find them online or potentially in your grocer during certain times of year. So they could be more easily accessible as a dye source. They're a little spendy, but you can always wait for the right season and head out to try to find them for free in a fungi foray. So one of the special things that we're going to look at with this particular mushroom is that it is pH sensitive. So today we're going to explore what the various modifiers will do to this dye after we have dyed our wool. To prep for that, we're going to wash our wool as we always do. And I'm gonna be sticking to wool because protein fibers 
are big fans of natural dye and mushrooms also like protein fibers. You can use cellulose fibers like cotton, but you will want to pre-treat them with a mordant. Now for today, I'm not going to use a mordant with my wool because this particular fungi will adhere to the fiber without. But if you'd like to pre-treat your fiber with a mordant, you potentially will get a, a slightly different color and B, potentially longer lasting bonds. However, I'm gonna opt out today because I know that lobster mushroom will work without mordant. If you choose to mordant your protein fiber, you can use alum at 15% of the weight of fiber. It's a very simple process. I have videos here that explain how to use alum as a protein fiber mordant and it's pretty easy. So it is a great practice to use mordants in general as many dye sources won't adhere well to fiber if it hasn't been pre-treated. Get in the habit of doing it or learn more about dye sources like lobster mushroom that do not necessarily require a mordant to welcome that color onto your fiber. In general, for most dye matter, you're going to want a one-to-one -one ratio of dye matter to weight of fiber. Today, I have very little fiber to dye. I only have one ounce of the lobster crusts, so I can easily dye up to one ounce of fiber. My scale is broken, so I won't be measuring any of that, but I know that the weight of the five small skeins I'm gonna be using will not be more than an ounce of fiber. So just keep that in mind. It's a great place to start. Sometimes you'll need a little bit more, sometimes you'll need a little bit less of the dye matter, but one-to-one -one is a ratio that often works with most dye matter. All right, let's get started. I'm going to make five small skeins of wool and then wash them. And then we'll get that lobster dye going in the pot. I will be placing the lobster into a mesh bag. And the only reason for that is because it is easier than trying to pick out the bits of mushroom from the fiber itself, especially when you're working with wool yarn. The bag I have is a nut milk bag, so they're easy to find and it just will save me one extra step. It'll also protect my fiber from potentially having any of the dye bits adhere to the fiber, thus creating a darker color. So by using the mesh bag, I can be assured of a more even dye. As you know from watching my channel, I don't often separate that, but I figured today would be a good one to try. Once we have our five skeins dyed, then we'll look at the pH modifiers and see how we might be able to expand our palette. Thank you. 
let this cool in the pot and it is so much pinker than I expected I love it I think that's because I'm using just the crusts so as I said they might be more powerful in terms of their coloring now I'm going to work on doing some shifting and in order to do that I'm going to use some modifiers we're going to be working with lemon distilled vinegar and cream of tartar which will be on the acidic side. And then we'll use baking soda and washing soda on the alkaline side. I'm going to place just a ladle full of the dye into each one of these containers. And then I'm going to add a half a teaspoon of each one of these to them. And we'll put the fiber right inside and see what happens. thought it was worth taking a comparative look at the colors that we got at the IFFS for the lobster which we used whole lobster mushrooms not just the crusts you can see it was treated with various mordants and then this is what I just got uh, quite a difference and I didn't use any mordant at all so this was just modified with those various pH shifting elements. And wow, I mean, look at that. That was my original, just in the lobster pot, if you will, versus what we got at IFFS. So it really shows you many things. One is that you really never know the result that you're gonna get necessarily. So you have to keep an open mind. 
but also that different mushrooms will bring you different results and that something as not simple as removing the outer orange crust on these mushrooms could bring you that kind of vivid color. So all of them are beautiful and definitely worth trying out if you ever have access to lobster mushrooms. What beautiful colors. I absolutely loved it. I do think that the brightness of this has something to do also with the fact that I dyed very little fiber. So obviously the strength can impact based upon how much fiber you're actually using. But also the crusts, I do believe, helped to create that stronger color all the way around. All of the samples that I got at IFFS were amazing to receive and they were dyeing hundreds of those pieces of wool so you can imagine those pots were quite busy. Now I am going to be saving the mushrooms themselves to have for exhaust baths in the future. I'll just pour them out and dry them and bundle them up for some future dye session and I'm going to be saving the dye itself. I'll put it into jars and place it outside in my holding shelves that I have for all of my exhaust dyes because you can continue to get beautiful color from exhaust baths, albeit lighter, but still they have a lot of potential long after the first time you use them. And remember that if your dye matter is pH sensitive, you can really expand your color palette. I mean, look at the five different variations that we got using simple household products. So keep that in mind if you're looking to alter color. You may have pH sensitivity like these lobster mushrooms and can create an array of beautiful shades. Yeah, and one more thing. Did you see the color that stayed on the nut milk bag that I used to hold the lobster mushroom? So that bag is 100% cotton. So it's a great way for you to see that in fact, you can get to color on cellulose fibers using lobster mushrooms. Okay, next week, we are going to stay in the kitchen. And this time, and for the next few videos, we're gonna be looking at soy milk. Looking at different ways in which we can use it to welcome designs into our dye practice. So, go find yourself some soybeans and get ready for the next couple of weeks while we look at this incredible protein source that can help us create some beautiful things on Fiverr. Have a great week and I'll see you next Friday. Oh, darn it. <laughs> this is the garage. <laughs> <laughs>